Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. Driving down the road, Joe Wendell, just talking to the Lord and feeling His presence. And so we encourage you to continue, of course, your personal relationship with God. We encourage you to do that. Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to stand and uh, go to the Word of God. Also, as Brother Mark mentioned, Brother Mark White had mentioned, next Sunday we'll be uh, they'll be doing their lunch next Sunday. So uh, we want to continue in prayer uh, for Brother Price. Also, we pray for the Orange family. There's a friend who he passed from his life about a week ago, his family. And the others that I know of, Sister Alice's niece, of course, lost her life here all back with her husband about two weeks ago. We pray for them. God continue to give them comfort. Also, Brother Worley has a son-in-law that was uh, dealing with COVID. Young man, we pray that God will continue to give him recovery. Praise the Lord. And uh, as Brother Dolly and I were speaking just before service, there's just a whole lot of things we see around us that indicate the coming of the Lord is, is near, even at the door. Well, in the midst of all of this, I want to take you to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. I want to read one short verse there. Then I will pray and allow you to be seated. I have about uh, 18 verses after that, so I want to read in our text this morning. Reading from the book of Nehemiah, this is during the course of the rebuilding of Jerusalem. They've rebuilt uh, the temple, but they're building the wall around the city of Jerusalem. And he said, So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. I want to use this my thought. It's not a new thought. I've heard other ministers use this. And uh, I looked for the author of this thought and found it. And I have books by him which I always speak of later. But the thought is this. Let's keep the main thing. The main thing. Let's keep the main thing. Mm -hmm. The main thing. Yeah. A lot of stuff going on, but let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Yes, amen. You believe that? Let's yes. give the Lord a hand of praise and thank you for the word. Praise God. Amen. 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 Reading from Romans chapter 12, you may be seated. I'm going to read verse 9 uh, through verse 18, I believe it is. Let love without the simulation... Let love be without the simulation. Now, Webster uses a, a definition regarding the simulation, uh, simply stated change. Let love be without change. Sometimes over the course of time, uh, English and other languages have a, ch a chance of changing. Uh, so that definition there is let love be without change. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now these are just a list of things that we as Christians are challenged by the Apostle Paul to do. Be kindly affection one another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant prayer. I like that. Distributing to the necessity of saints. Given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. That's a powerful one there. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much as lieth in you. And I realize we all have our measure of lying or having peace with others. 
He said, live peaceably with all men as much as life in you. Mm -hmm. Amen. In other words, as much ability as you have to do that, exercise it to the fullest degree. Some time ago, I, uh, I was uh, encouraged to buy a book by an author by the name of Stephen Cole. Some of you may have books by this gentleman. Uh, he is the one that uh, coined this phrase, keep the main thing, the main thing. And I have two or three of his books. Some of those are entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. And the other one is The Eighth Habit. I cannot tell you I read all of the last one, The Eighth Habit, but it is a very interesting book. It's down in the weeds, so to speak, uh, when you start dealing with uh, the structure of perception and interacting with other individuals in life and facing the challenges that we do as we go forward. But I'm borrowing this quote today from him because I feel like it coins what I want to convey to our church and those that are here and those that are listening today. Uh, because it's easy to get our eyes off of the main thing. Really easy to get our eyes off of the main thing that God has called us as a church to fulfill. Now, I was uh, raised in Pentecost. I came to know the Pentecostal way when I was five years old. Uh, my mom took me to church. She was raised around or in the church uh, since she was just a small teenage girl, around 12 or 14 years old. And I remember her testimonies. They went to an old country church then that set up on blocks in a certain part of town, and uh, the windows were left open, and all the community would sit outside, namely most of the men, and they'd sit out there and chew their tobacco and dip their snuff, and they would talk about what the crazy Pentecostals were doing on the inside. <clears throat> Matter of fact, my dad, he told me, or my mother told me, when dad became first interested in mother, uh, he would stand outside, look through the window, and watch her worship. Now, mother, uh, was not inhibited at all by anybody watching her worship. She said, I look back on it now as a young girl, and being a young girl at the time, uh, she said, but I was quite vocal. She would pray, shout, worship, jump, dance. Amen. When her prospective husband was, she didn't know it at the time, was watching her, I guess, through the window. And eventually, Dad got bold enough to go into the church, and uh, later on, some years later, uh, my dad received the Holy Ghost in 1957. I was there. That was down in Pleasant Grove, uh, around the Dallas area, off of Lake June Road. Some of you know where Lake June Road, not far off of Buckner Boulevard. And uh, they had a little church there that a gentleman had built. Actually, it was a block building, fairly solid building. Uh, it had a tin roof, and we had the old folding uh, slatted wooden chairs. Some of you remember those slatted wooden chairs. You, they were the first ones you, you know, unfold. And uh, when the church service would really get going good, people get to worship waving their hands, chicken feathers would start going in the air. And I'm sure they tried to clean that building before we got it as a church, but still there were chicken feathers uh, in that building. And we kids, of course, love to see the chicken feathers. And uh, <coughs> little downy ones, you know, and they would start floating up in the atmosphere of the church. It wasn't the Shekinah, as some people call it. It was actually chicken feathers. And uh, I don't know, you may have not have done this as a child, but we used to get up underneath the chicken feather. We'd, we'd blow and just see how high, you know, we could get it up. So that was our entertainment. Uh, the pastor at that church, his name was Brother Todd. C-T-O-D-D -D Todd. And uh, one of the exciting things about the church is right across the street from the donut shop. Every now and then, his sons, who were teenage boys, quite mischievously, but they threw papers to earn their living, I guess. Whatever living was they had to earn. And they would go across the street and get glazed donuts. And if I was lucky, I'd be able to talk them out of one. And they would share their donuts in or out of church. And so uh, those are some of the memories I had. But... I remember the pastor getting up there preaching with great intensity and preaching something I'm sure that was stirring the hearts of people. One night I remember getting up there and he got to singing a song. Some of you may remember the song, Oh, Somebody Touched Me. He touched me and I turned around. Somebody touched me. Well, it must have been the hand of the Lord. <laughs> and the Lord must have touched him that night because he slapped his foot on the platform, went clear through the wood, 
buried it up to about his ankle. <laughs> Amen. I watched him as he pulled it out of the platform. The Lord obviously had really, really touched him that night. Amen. But those are some things I remember as a child. But over and above the things that were entertaining, the things that would get the attention of a young boy, the thing that I really recall was the wonderful, awesome presence of God that filled that little building that was probably about maybe 30 feet wide, 50 feet long, or a little longer maybe. It would hold probably at a maximum maybe around 50 individuals in that building at the max. And, and there it was. You know, people would get in there and it finally grew and it filled up. And I remember we eventually had to build a building that would seat uh, around 200 or 250. Amen. From that little chicken house church would all start. But there's one thing I remember as a child. Every time I went, I knew something supernatural was going to happen. Those people would come in there and sing to the top of their voices. They would sing and they would magnify the Lord with all of their hearts. And amen. And it was the typical prayer request. Women praying for their husbands. Different ones praying that, you know, somebody would receive the Holy Ghost. That some would get their healing. It was the typical Pentecostal prayer request over the years that we hear. But, you know, the Spirit of the Lord that fell there is no different also than what we feel here. Yeah. Now, that was in 1957. I don't have the map right off the top of my head, but I, I'm feeling fairly certain, you know, that uh, has been uh, something over 50 years ago for sure. And uh, at least that long. And uh, I remember seeing people receive the Holy Ghost. The one that really stuck with me, of course, was my dad. Dad didn't go to church much at all. Uh, dad was a good guy. He worked at uh, the Ford plant in Dallas. And uh, he didn't mind mother going. And he saw to it that we all got to go to Sunday school. But that night, Dad went. It wasn't his first time to get a Pentecostal church. But I've told this story before because that's what stuck out to me as a young boy was Dad loved cigars. And he kept a pocket full of King Edward <laughs> cigars stuck in his uh, front pocket. He always had three or four. And if that wasn't enough, there's always half of one here and there <laughs> in the house somewhere. And, uh, and I grew up smelling cigars. But I remember Dad, uh, that night, something got a hold of Dad. He went to the front of the building. He went to this side here from the back, stood down there, lifted his hands. He immediately began to weep and cry. And it wasn't long until people gathered around and they got in a circle around me. Mostly the ladies, some men. And they began to pray for my dad. My dad lifted his hands and he was weeping and repenting and asking God to fill him with the Holy Ghost. And sure enough, it was only just a matter of a short time. The Holy Ghost that I'd seen fall on other people that Chris fell on my dad in 1957. And I watched Dad become, I mean, I've never seen my dad drunk. That's the first time I ever saw my dad intoxicated. But my dad was so intoxicated, he couldn't hardly walk, Brother Eves. He was falling to the right and the left. He was crying and waving his hands and talking in a heavenly language. And he'd move this way and that side of the circle would kind of put their hands on him, move him back to center. And he'd go over here in the middle, move him back to center. And Dad would just have him church and... I don't know how long it went, but as I've often said in days gone by, amen, amen. King uh, Edward Cigars went one way and King Jesus came in that night. Mm -hmm. Amen. Never again did my dad ever smoke another cigar. Never again did he ever take a chew of tobacco. Amen. In 1957, something happened in that church that I believe with all of my heart here in the year of 2021. Now, is still the main thing of the church. Yeah. Amen. I said it's still the main thing of the church. Praise the Lord. I'm happy for all the good things that have happened over the years and how God has blessed the church. Amen. I remember a story that was told recently of Starbucks. And some of you may drink their coffee. And some of you may not. I have drank a few cups of it. I'm not a big heavy coffee drinker, but I get a few gift cards every Christmas. And I use a few of them along the way, but nevertheless, here a while back, just a year or so ago, or two years ago, I forget how long exactly, Starbucks began to witness a decline in their sales. Now, that's hard to believe because, you know, it looks like there's always a line stretched out on the highway. But some years ago, they experienced a decline in their sales. And they brought all of their directors together and different ones together to try to find out why it was uh, 
that they were losing money in their sales. They finally came to a conclusion, and that was this. They had started making all kinds of little deli sandwiches. You know, just special sandwiches and selling cakes and donuts and different things and turnovers. And they really started promoting all of that. They really started promoting all of that. And then they realized when they started getting away from the thing that made them popular. Amen. When they realized they got away from the thing that made them popular. Thank you, sir. They realized that their focus was on other things, that their sales began to go down. Their sales began to go down. They came to this conclusion. They said, we were made popular because we made a good cup of coffee. And so they said, we need to get back to making good coffee. Amen. Just focus on good coffee. Well, I want you to know this. The Pentecostal church is known for Pentecostalism. We've always been known, amen, that we were a Pentecostal church. A church that believes in the infilling of the Spirit of God. A church that believes in the outpouring of the Spirit. A church that believes that the infilling of the Spirit of God will change your life. Mm -hmm. That God can deliver you from drugs, amen, and every kind of a sin, amen, that would encroach upon the holiness and the purity of God. Amen. amen. We were made popular because, amen, of Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. We don't need to get away from our good coffee. I said, we don't need to get away from our good coffee. Can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. We need to stick with what made us famous. We need to stay with the thing that put the Pentecostal church on the map. That was a move of God. That was anointed preaching. That was witnessing miracles in the house of God. See, people unashamedly walk to the front of the church and lift their hands and sins and be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I submit to you, let's keep the main thing the main yeah. thing. Yeah. Oh, let's give God. Hallelujah. 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 God we pray. They came to the conclusion, we better stick with what made us famous. I uh, look back over the years and uh, I, I see a lot of things in churches and we ourselves do. And there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. We've got bake sales and banquets. We've got some of the best cooks and the best barbecuers. I'll tell you, there's two things Pentecostal folks know how to do. I'm not, I'm not, not no, to put it aside just the spiritual stuff. There's two things they know how to do. They know how to sing and they know how to eat. <laughs> they know they know how to sing and they know how to cook if you're looking for a good cook and a good singer I listened to brother brother Finney said the other day he said in the gospel world of quartets and different music groups he said it's a known fact if you can find you a spirit filled Pentecostal he said you got you a singer if you can find you a spirit-filled Pentecostal, he said, because they know how to sing, and they sing in the anointing. You can feel the Spirit of God, amen, when they sing. Praise the Lord. I thought about Sister Ewing, the younger Sister Ewing, some years ago. Came out on stage in front of, I think it was America's Got Talent or something like that. And she was singing a gospel song with a choir. And people sitting in those chairs watching her sing in that auditorium, they started rubbing their arms with their hands and said, my God, I feel something when she sings. Praise the Lord. Amen. I feel something. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's what's made us famous. That's what put Pentecost on the map. Amen. Was the anointing of God. Not just working in the flesh, but the anointing of God. Amen. I thank God that we got good cooks and good singers and good barbecuers. I thank God that sometime when I first came to Gladewater and I landed here, one of the first things I realized I needed to do was get a baseball uniform. Because at that time, amen, brother, amen, we had a baseball team. And brother Longmire Kilgore had a baseball team. Dallas had a baseball team. Everywhere you looked, there were baseball teams. 
And our uniform of all colors, orange is not necessarily my favorite color to be wearing, and, you know, predominantly. But our uniform was white and orange. I've still got a ball cap in my closet, I think, but I didn't throw it away. It's got ALT right on the top. Amen. I got my baseball jersey with an orange stripe down the leg, you know, and the orange letters on the vest. And I got all of that. In fact, I found two of my baseball gloves. Almost couldn't pull them apart. They've been sitting in the closet so long. But I put them up in my little office so I could kind of put them on display, you know, and that to my awesome of history I've got there. And, uh, <clears throat> but when I came to Gladewater, they, you know, you played baseball. I remember we played one morning uh, in the morning, one o'clock in the morning, right down here on this field that they redid. And Brother Rex Johnson brought a church from Dallas, and there's another church, and Gladewater that night just happened to be the champion team. And we had won more games than anybody. It was 12 o'clock that night, we were going to go home. But if you know Brother Rex Johnson, he said, nope, we're not going home till we play one more game. <laughs> he could not go back to Dallas without winning the game. So he did win the last game. But I found out in 1980 that Gladewater enjoyed baseball. And we had a lot of baseball players. Amen. We've had fall festivals, art shows. One of our largest crowds was a car show right here, Brother Dolly. Amen. According to ticket sales and also to those that signed up for different things, we had motorcycles, we had custom cars, we had fancy cars, we had all kinds of really expensive cars here. We had somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people. This road was blocked off. People were not allowed to come down through. The police had it blocked. We had people that like six flags out there. I mean, you could stir them with a stick from one end of that road to the other. That was probably the largest crowd we've ever had on this particular property. But I've come here this morning to tell you, it's not bake sales. It's not barbecues. It's not car shows. It's not even song fest. But I'm going to tell you what has made the church the church what it is today. We've been making good coffee for a number of years. And that coffee is the anointing of the Spirit of God. Amen. Preaching Pentecostal messages. Seeing lives changed by the power of the Holy Ghost. And folks, we don't need to change our recipe. This is what has made us famous. I'm telling you, just recently, people walked through these doors. And they said, I've never been here before. But I noticed there's an atmosphere of the presence of God that is in that building that I've never felt anywhere else. I'm coming back to feel the anointing of God. Amen. Abundant life. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. In Jesus' name, let's keep it the main I remember we had a particular thing going on here at Abundant Life some years ago. One of the individuals that was involved and coordinated it felt like it was not bringing quite as much attention to what he was trying and aspiring to do. I remember that night you could feel a little pull in the service. It wasn't moving quite like it would normally would. Amen. And I picked up on what was happening and all of a sudden this individual just got frustrated and walked out. Amen. Just it wasn't going the way he wanted it to go. And so he just walked out of the service. Oh my. There's an old cliche we use around here every now and then in Texas and different places. It's called the tails wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. We come to church for one reason. Jesus said, and if I, if I even if I, I be lifted up. I will draw all men unto me. I want you to know it's not about this fellow right here. It's not about glorifying Brother McGuire. It's not about lifting up Brother Whitehead. It's not about exalting Brother Don or Brother Eves or Brother Petrie or Brother Jerry McGuire. That's not what this is about. Amen. When we conclude our services, people ought to walk out of here, Brother Chris, and say it was good to have been in the presence of the Almighty God. It was good to hear the preaching about Jesus Christ and His power and His glory. That's the main thing. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's praise Him for the Lord. Hallelujah. Now my hat's off. We had all of those that 
sacrifice, spent time and energy in putting our car shows together. We had quite a, quite a, quite a group of guys doing a great job. We used it for one simple reason, and that was to bring people to this area let them know there's a church in Blake Park. Okay. Amen. To interact with people in the community and build some relationships. Not just so we could brag on their cars or their motorcycles. We brought them here so that we could actually tell them about Jesus. Yeah. That was our real motive. <clears throat> Amen. Call it a little or whatever, but that was our real motive, was to connect with people and tell them about Jesus Christ. Amen. Because you see, my friend, as I state, it's not about me. It's not about you. We're here on a mission. We're here on a mission. Amen. We're here on a mission. Amen. And Brother Chris, you were part of that mission. Amen. God wonderfully filled you with the Spirit. That's the objective of the church, is to see men and women changed by the power of God. Amen. I'm not down. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Amen. If we have big bake sales, small bake sales, or barbecues or whatever, that's all well and good. I think we ought to do the very best we can with the best we've got. We may not even have a baseball team, amen, right now that I know of. But if we get one, that's all right with me. And if somebody wants to spend the time and the money and buy the uniforms, that's okay with me. But I'll tell you one thing, if anything is at the top of the heap, if anything's going to be at the top of the heap, amen, it's going to be lifting up Jesus Christ. It's going to be praised in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. There's nobody that loves a nice looking car more than I do. And he's a dog. I love, I love hot rods. I love classic cars. Had one for several years. Amen. Now I've got a little sports car. Amen. And I've got an excuse to drive it because I loan my truck out to my son in law. So I've got a good excuse. You see me in it, I'm not trying to look the rule. I got my truck on that. <laughs> but that gives me a little excuse. <clears throat> Get to drive up down the road. Amen. It's a lot of fun. But I want you to know this. None of those things. None of those things. None of those things, right. none of those things can even come close yes. That's right. to the main thing. Yes. That's right. I said to the main thing. Yes, amen. When my children get sick, I wasn't going to drive my GTO up to the window, aim a rack down on my pops, open up the headers and say, I believe you're going to feel better. You can just hear this GTO. Amen. No, no, I wasn't doing that. Uh, amen. I didn't drive up beside the window, crank up my Harley Davidson, rack down on it, make a loud sound, hit the horn and say, honey, do you feel something moving through your body right now? Make you feel a little better. Lift that depression. Oh, no. Friend, I know where the answer comes from. It doesn't come from the things of this world. My help cometh from the Lord. I said, my help cometh from the Lord. It came to me back then. It's coming to me now. Oh, yeah. And it'll be the same tomorrow. That's the main thing. Oh, yeah. I get anointed up here. I'll be talking into that water bottle and drinking out of the microphone. Hallelujah. I don't want to ever think, well, I didn't get my 15 seconds of fame. I got to have my 15 seconds of fame. No, no, no. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Amen. The main thing in Pentecostal circles has been in the past, and I believe it's the same still here today, that if the Spirit of the Lord gets to moving and somebody comes up here and starts singing a song or worshiping the Lord and God just takes over this place, it's not about me getting to preach. I preached nearly probably 3,000 messages in the last several years. Amen. I've done that. I've done that over and over again. I'm not worried about my 15 seconds of sunshine. What I am worried about is that we would open a service up and close a service and nobody ever feel anything. Yeah. Nobody ever experience anything. Nobody get closer to God. Nobody feel like they want to know about, about Jesus. My folks, when that's the case, then that is not a service that I want to be a part of. The part I want to be of, that if it's a little four-year-old girl standing down here in the front with her hands raised, uh, weeping and crying, it provokes others to pray and God's moving. Hey, I want to be in that. Because that's what made the church what it is. Uh, yeah. And that's the main thing. I said that's the main, that's thing. the main thing. If somebody gets up here and hardly can't keep three notes, amen, in harmony, 
but they sing with all their heart and God anoints them and the Holy Ghost falls. My friend, that was the main thing. It made the church popular then. It'll make the church popular today. It worked then and it'll work now. Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever. Let's give Jesus the main thing. Oh, give him some praise. Praise. Master, the disciples said, Matthew 22, 36 through 40, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. In other words, it's, a, it's like a close cousin. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That, Jesus said, is the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, so many times we've heard great messages on different things. We've left astounded by men's wisdom and understanding and intellect. We've been in ways and many times been so persuaded, amen, by just an emotional moment, rather than a lingering and everlasting principle, that I am challenged by God Almighty that the main thing of the church Amen. Is to love the Lord thy God with all my heart and with all my soul. I think it is possible for some people to go through the motions and pretend and convince themselves they're following God when they've never really fallen in love with God. All right. All right. You've got to fall in love with God. That's right. That's right. I said you've got to fall in love with God. When you fall in love with God, you talk to God. Mm -hmm. When you fall in love with God, you want to be where God is. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about things that God likes to talk about. Yes. You're not ashamed to be seen with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not ashamed for anyone to recognize you, amen, as a friend of God. That's right. When you love God. Mm -hmm. When you love God. When you love God, you're not ashamed to be seen with God. That's right. That's right. Somebody said, how can you be seen with God when God is invisible? Amen. Your life will reflect the fact that you're in company with Him. His glory will put a cast, a sheen, a glow, if you please. So he will put your life in a context that you don't have to walk around with a bumper sticker between your shoulder blades telling somebody you're a Christian. Yeah. When you fall in love with Jesus, they'll pick up on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, they will. Oh, yeah, you don't have to have your Sunday best on. You can be walking around with nothing but just work clothes, coveralls, overalls. But if you've been talking to God, they're going to know it. If you're a friend of God, they're going to identify with it. I remember years ago, I was so elated over the fact, amen, what, what a shame it was. <clears throat> Back in 1980-something. I was flying back and forth from St. Louis to Dallas quite often. And I uh, got on a plane one day back in the early 80s, and a man asked me, he said, I don't mean to pry, <clears throat> but he said, uh, are you Audie Murphy? <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Audie Murphy was before my time. <laughs> Audie Murphy was in World War II. He later became a Hollywood uh, art prop, played a lot of westerns. And, uh, <laughs> so I didn't know whether that was good or bad because I, I knew what Audie Murphy looked like. <laughs> but I knew my name. My name was Mike McGuire, and I said, no, sir. I said, I'm Michael McGuire. He said, has anybody ever told you you're a dead ring for Audie Murphy? I said, no, sir, they haven't. Well, first thing I did, I got off that plane. I got home. I got to looking up all the murder. <laughs> this is going to be real good or real bad. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I didn't know if he looked more like, you know, uh, well, you know, the little fellow said, you're my little chickie. Yeah, get his name. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Well, it wasn't so bad. A few days after that, I was at the old building over there, and we had some air conditioning break down. And the air conditioner guy came, worked on the air conditioning unit. You gotta realize I look a little different every day. 
This is about 1984 or 5, somewhere around there. He walked out the side door of the church, going back to his truck, put his tools up. He stopped just mid stride Stop. He said, you mind if I ask you a question? I said, no, what's that? Has anybody ever told you you look like Audie Murphy? <laughs> All these years I come in making money, folks. Kept Audie Murphy at home. Hey, man, I could have just, you know, pretended. Signed a lot of autographs. Made a lot of money. But you see, that's not who I am. I'm not in love with Audie Murphy. I'm in love with Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. And what would really thrill my soul if somebody walked up in the course of the day and said, you know what you remind me of? You remind me of somebody that's been with Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. You remind me of somebody that's been in the presence of God. That's what they used to tell those old time Pentecostals. They'd walk out of the woods after an old fashioned prayer meeting. Get under an old bus armor. Have a few rotten tomatoes thrown at it. Go to their jobs. And people would say, hey, has anybody ever told you? You remind me of a Holy Ghost filled man that loves Jesus with all of your heart. Hey, folks, let's keep the main thing the main thing. Oh, praise him. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. That's what they were saying. Yeah. That's what Brother Sam like said. I like that. I like that. If we're his disciples, we'll have love one to another. That's what put us on that. That's what made us really recognize the people of God. That was our cup of coffee. We don't need to change it. Mm -hmm. I said we don't need to change it. No. He said love without dissimulation. Mm -hmm. Something that will not change over time. That the love back then is the same love as it is now. And the love that is now is the same as it was back then. Love without dissimulation. Holy Ghost is doing the same thing in you that it did in your daddy. Mm -hmm. Holy Ghost is doing the same thing in your daddy as it did in the grandpa. It's the same thing. I think of the words of Paul when he wrote to Timothy. He said, he said when I remember the, the faith that was found first in my grandmother Lois and my mother Eunice. And he said, I trust Timothy. Mm -hmm. That it's in you also. In you also. Because that's what made your family. Famous. That's right. Yeah. That's what put your family on the map, Timothy. Was your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And he said, if you've got what they've got, mm -hmm. you're keeping the main thing. The main thing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Folks, let's not lose, amen, what made us famous. That's right. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. That's right. We're no, going to go you. through a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. Yes. If God tarries another 10 years, we're going to go through a lot of junk. Mm -hmm. A lot of things you cannot help, but it's going to affect the church and everybody attending the church. There's going to be things changing technology to the point that you're going to virtually be able to go places you've never gone before. And there are people who are virtually going to fall in love with fictitious and imaginary characters on a screen. And they're going to be able to attach their bodies to that screen and experience a relationship with something that doesn't even exist. That's where we're headed. And people have the ability to do that. And it will be commonplace, found in your homes. And you can tell your neighbors, I went to Hawaii. I smelled the sea breeze. I felt the breeze. Amen. I experienced all of this. And you will have never left the house. And you're going to find people are going to be captured by the imagination. And the world of technology is going to be able to master our minds and our moods and our emotions. But I'm here to tell you with all the little candy that's been put in front of us. I hope to God that somebody goes back to the book and remembers how we made coffee. Oh, yeah. Amen. 
I hope we don't forget what it was like to have our own personal prayer meetings uh, when nobody's in the room but just you and Jesus uh, and you got in a realm of the Holy Ghost uh, and you began to speak with other tongues uh, as the Spirit gives the utterance. Uh, there's no technology that can take the place of that. Uh, there's no entertainment that can take the place of that. That's what made us famous. Oh yeah. That's what made us famous. That's what put us on the map. And bless God, we need to keep the main thing. The main thing. Let's praise the Lord with all our Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. I'm coming to close, but I remember in high school, in 19 and, uh, 19 and 68, 69, and uh, we had a particular reading that we did, and it actually talked about the computer age that was coming and the ability that uh, the holograms that would be created where the people actually you could see them standing in the room that they wouldn't really be standing there. But through a hologram, it would appear as though they were there. Some of you that have seen different things of late, you know what it is to see a singer uh, walk out on stage and sing with her father, who had died many years ago. But, I mean, the harmony is great. I mean, the mix is beautiful. It's like you're singing. It's happening right before your eyes. The truth of the fact is, her father was nothing but a hologram. You can put your hand right through that image. Walk around it. He's 360 degrees complete. Man's technology far surpasses anything that we could imagine. But back in my day in senior year, we were reading about stuff like that, and it sounded so science fiction. Mm -hmm. I didn't see how in the world anything like that could exist. That was since I was in high school. And things have changed so dramatically. And I can assure you of this, my friend. Technology is going to master the minds, the moods, and the emotions of humanity in the next 10 years like we've never seen before. People's rise and fall, amen, their good days and their bad days are going to be based upon something that they can watch, they can hear, that can be attached to their bodies. And they'll be able to experience emotions and highs and visit places they've never gone before just through virtual intelligence that is being developed right now where computers are able to look at your face and call you by name. Now, where they're able to take a picture of your body 360 degrees, reproduce it in a hologram, and make people think you're standing somewhere that you're not. <clears throat> you can only imagine, amen, when sin gets a hold of all of that, what it's going to do to the church. Now, when you start talking about simple things like bowing a knee, not because you're promoting a particular anti-establishment idea, but because of the devotion to an unknown God that some people don't know how to worship. Mm -hmm. When you start doing stuff like that, it's going to seem so far-fetched to this high, intelligent mind of these last days that people are going to laugh at you and say you're so far behind times. But you're going to be someone that remembers the main thing that made us and kept us all these years before there was even a radio when there was nothing but an upper room. Mm -hmm. That's all there was, but just an upper room. And Jesus said, go there and tarry there until you be a dupe with power from on high. Mm -hmm. That was the main thing then. Yes. That's the main thing now. Satan's going to try to reproduce it. He's going to create all kinds of allurements to try to capture the minds and the attention of this world. But we as a church have got to keep the main thing. The main thing. That's right. That's right. I come to conclusion as musicians come. Winning people to Jesus Christ is really what it's all about. Winning people to Jesus Christ, that's the main thing. Brother Chris, you're the only one here that's new, so I'm going to pick on you. But you're an inspiration. You're an inspiration. Because the rest of us, you take Tanya and the other Chris over here. They've already been here a little while. They're not like brand new like you are. And they're as happy for you as we are. But about the time you get to thinking you can't have babies anymore, mm -hmm. God, it's a good thing to see somebody get the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And when the time 
was trying to give birth, there's still strength to bring forth. And I just have a hanger. There's a whole lot more of them around the body of life that God's getting in that birth now. I really feel like it. And God has a way of doing it. Yeah. We're going to pray and we're going to believe God to do it, but God's got His ways to do it. Amen. And young people and young Marys and others are going to come walking into this church in these last days. And we as a bundle of life have made up our minds. We're not going to forget the main thing. Now, church body, I know there's some of us that would like to get them all dressed up, cranked up, and ready to go on all in just a few days. But it may not work that way. Our main thing is that they are introduced to Jesus Christ. That they repent of their sins. They get baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the main thing. And then as they associate and interact with the body of Christ, and they watch your godly example as you live for God, amen, they realize, amen, the direction they need to take to know Him in even a greater fashion. That's the main thing. In a nutshell, that's what we're here to do. Amen. Is to make everyone feel like they're loved. Not just feel like they're loved. Know they're loved. We want them in here. And we're ready to stand beside of them and face the unknown future. Amen. Because we've got a hold of something that will never wear out. It will never go out. Amen. It will always be there. And that's the main thing. Hallelujah to God. If you believe that, stand to your feet and glorify God with your voices and with your hands. And let the Lord know that you're so happy that you're a part of the church of the living God. You've still got the baptism of the Holy Ghost inside of you.